Many people outside of the profession are unaware that graduates of the University of Montana Law School do not have to sit for the bar examination in that state. They are licensed to practice by acclamation simply by their graduating from the law school run by the state. However, a number of Montana citizens or a number of others who wish to practice law in Montana attend law school at Gonzaga and Spokane or the University of Washington, for instance, in Seattle. Some might go to the University of Idaho's law school in Moscow. And so for these who graduate from the foreign law schools, we might say, the state provides a bar examination. And I suppose it's a pretty good measure of their ability to practice law in Montana. Many years ago, there was an apocryphal question going around for the bar in Montana for these foreign law students. And that was along the lines of, from where does the governor of Montana receive his authority? And various answers would be submitted to the board of examiners, such as the, the King of England, King of France through the Louisiana Purchase. Perhaps some people said as by the people of the state, from the citizenry, from the United States Congress. And of course, they all flunked the answer to that question because the correct answer was from the boardroom of the Anaconda Copper Company in New York City. The joke was that the Bar Association had to keep things straight and know exactly where their authority came from. Once again, now this is Father Eugene Tracy speaking to you from SFX Parish in Spokane. And today I am sharing with you a few thoughts on authority. Not the authority of a state governor, but the authority of the church. The authority in particular of the Catholic Church. In another one of these podcasts, we discussed the origin of the church. The fact that it is of divine origin, organized and founded by our Lord Jesus Christ, who remains the head of the church. And because Jesus Christ himself is the head of the church, those who are called, those who have accepted his invitation of salvation, the church then, ourselves, has complete authority. A testimony to this can be found at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel. Jesus was preparing for his ascension into heaven. The disciples, the 11 apostles at that time, were getting ready to begin the work that he had given them. Jesus having built the church on the foundation stones of the apostles. St. Matthew writes, The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Jesus Christ gave full authority to the church with himself as the head because of his promise to remain with the church until the last day. Reading that, we then can recall what St. Matthew wrote earlier in his gospel. That is, the encounter that Jesus the Christ had with St. Peter. When he told Peter, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Receive the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And thus the Catholic Church believes that Jesus gave St. Peter vicarious authority to lead and to govern the church. St. Luke writes that this authority was given to St. Peter for the purpose of strengthening the brethren, in particular strengthening the other apostles. Later, the other apostles themselves, along with St. Peter, received the authority to forgive sins, and they also received the authority to bind and loose. All of this with the promise of our Lord to never abandon his church. He told St. Peter to remember that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And so their apostles and their successors, the bishops of the church, the Catholic church and the Orthodox churches, share this authority then to teach, to sanctify, and to govern vicariously in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when they do so in communion with each other and consistently with the tradition that has been passed down to them 
from the very hands of the apostles. Now this vicarious authority given to the church by Jesus Christ is sometimes called a gift or a charism, and it is shared by the bishops when in communion with each other, they teach and they sanctify and they govern. A rogue bishop who breaks communion, who organizes his own particular sect or his own particular group or ordains his own particular priests or ordains other bishops does not share in this charism of authority because it is only exercised in the context of the church as a whole and the bishops share it with each other. This charism is sometimes called infallibility when it is directed toward matters of faith and morals. It does not extend to matters of discipline. And it also is a constitutional infallibility in that it is limited to what our Lord Jesus Christ has given to the apostles as a matter of faith or moral living. So for instance, if the bishops were to get together and to teach the flat earth theory, we not only know they would be wrong, but that would not be an exercise of infallibility because it doesn't pertain to faith or morals. Likewise, if the bishops were to get together and to decree that the ceremonies of the church were to be exclusively and only in Latin for all time in the future, or Swahili, or Yiddish, or in any other language one might choose, it also would not be an exercise of authority because that pertains to church discipline. That is how the church leads its life. But on the other hand, when the church through the bishops proclaims that Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, she speaks, the bishops speak with the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ because in communion with each other, they are proclaiming a truth of the faith. When the church sometimes appears to speak what we might say incorrectly in matters of faith and morals, generally the answer is not incorrect, it is simply incomplete. It needs to be augmented and reformulated. For instance, the bishops of the 16th century had no concept of nuclear war, but when they speak in communion with each other about the morality of war and the immorality of the longbow, they are using 16th century language to elucidate timeless principles, which then the bishops of our era can apply to nuclear war. As kind of an interesting sidelight to this, I mentioned that we need to remember that the bishops universally need to speak in communion with each other. And so in the 1980s, when the United States bishops on their own, exercising their teaching authority, taught that nuclear weapons could be used only as a deterrent, they were at odds with the French bishops, who, because of their recent history in the European wars, decided that nuclear weapons could be used defensively, which also was in contrast to the German bishops who met at the same time and decided that nuclear weapons should not be used at all. And this is a question that the bishops still have not resolved among themselves. And so that simply gives an example of how the church will work through current moral problems with the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church cannot decree anything in matters of faith or morals that was not handed on by the apostles. I've talked a number of times about how infallibility might be exercised. One of the ways that it's exercised is when the bishops dispersed throughout the world teach the same truth, the same truth of faith and of moral life. Another way is when the church gathers together her bishops in a worldwide council, and they have the opportunity to speak with each other and to converse with each other and to develop communion and to hone thoughts at that time. The last of these councils was held at the Vatican in Rome from 1962 to 1965. The one prior, immediately previous, was held in the Vatican also in the year 1879. And the third worldwide council, going back, was held in northern Italy at Trent, and it was held in 1545 to 1563. 
And so one can see that the church does this very, very rarely and always with good reason. Another way that the church exercises infallibility is through the teachings of the Bishop of Rome declared to be infallible in communion with the bishops throughout the world. And this has been exercised twice. Once in the 19th century in the promulgation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the second time in 1950 on the dogma of her assumption, her bodily assumption into heaven at the time of her earthly death. And the bishops dispersed throughout the world concurred with the Pope in expressing that these ancient beliefs were part of the doctrine and the dogma of the church. An individual bishop is not infallible. The Holy Father can make a determination that certain teachings of the church are infallible, not because of his own promulgation of them, but because they have been held from the time of the apostles, such as the belief that only males in the church, baptized males, may be ordained priest and bishop. Pope John Paul II noted that this is an infallible teaching because it has been taught by the bishops dispersed through the world from the time of the apostles. Now, there are other groups, other Christian groups, that don't hold to this concept of authority and infallibility according to the mind of the Catholic Church. For instance, the Orthodox churches will attribute more authority to their individual bishops and the bishops in communion with them. Having broken communion with Rome, they will pledge their allegiance to the worldwide councils of bishops that occurred before the year 1054, but insist that no such worldwide council has been held since because they were excluded. And so the bishops of the Orthodox churches lead their faithful according to that particular set of beliefs and their contemporary spin on them, and so the Orthodox can hold differing beliefs. There are other Christian groups, such as the Protestants, who use the Bible as the basis for sanctifying teaching and governing. They say that the Bible, and only the Bible alone, is useful for that. They recognize that the Bible is a product of the church, as we've discussed in other podcasts, and they will gather together in synods and meetings to help perhaps collectively understand what the Bible might say. Other groups, fundamentalist Christian groups, use the Bible as their sole authority for the authority of the church, but they do so differently from the Protestants. They place their confidence in Christ speaking to a believer, an individual believer on an individual basis through the sacred scriptures. Thus, what might be a matter of faith and morals, a matter of teaching, sanctifying, and governing for one group of fundamentalists may be radically different from another group of fundamentalists. And so life in the body of Christ continues. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ has said that he will be faithful to the end of the age as long as we believe and teach and hand on what we have received from the apostles. And so God bless you.